Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is now a week since Parliament voted to delay Brexit yet again. It is a week since this Parliament voted yet again to force Brussels to keep this country in the European Union for at least another three months at a cost of a billion pounds a month. And in that week, in the, in the days since then, the Government has tried to be reasonable and to ascribe the best possible motives to our friends and colleagues around the House. And I've twice offered more time for debate, Mr Speaker. I offered more time last week. I made the same offer last night. I said that we were prepared to debate this bill, the withdrawal bill, round the clock to allow Parliament time to scrutinise this bill to the point of intellectual exhaustion. And bear in mind, Mr Speaker, that not only has this House been considering this issue for three and a half years, but last week, when this bill was being debated, there was not a single new idea, there was not a single new suggestion. All they wanted was more time, more weeks, more months, when they could not even provide the Speakers to fill the time allotted. And I give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Prime Minister for eventually giving way. Um, I, I wonder, um, well, we can all go ooh, like children, but we are trying to actually get something through. So, I, what I would like to ask the Prime Minister is just going back to the comments that he made when he opened this week. Either this House voted for the second reading, yeah. or it delayed it. He can't have it both ways, which is what he seems to want. I'd just like to ask the Prime Minister, I would like to ask the Prime Minister if he would like to just go back over his first comments and address whether he thinks that they were entirely correct, because almost everything that he said to me seemed as if he might be misleading the House and the country. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, was, I am astonished to hear that the uh, Honourable Lady uh, thinks that she voted for the programme motion uh, last week. That's, that's the logic of what she said. She, as far as I understand, she voted for delay. She voted, she voted to delay Brexit indefinitely. And, and, that's, and, and let's, let's be absolutely clear. The whole country, the whole country, the whole country can see what is the whole country can see what's really going on, Mr yeah. Speaker. She doesn't want does she want to deliver Brexit? No, she doesn't. She doesn't want to deliver Brexit, Mr Speaker. They can see that they don't want to deliver Brexit. All they want to do is procrastinate. They don't want to deliver Brexit on October the thirty first, on November the thirty first, even on January the thirty first, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I give way a uh, pleasure to my honourable friend. To the Prime Minister in giving way, can the Prime Minister confirm the only indicative vote that passed through this Parliament was to find alternative arrangements to the backstop, and this Prime Minister removed the backstop from the yeah, deal. Yeah. This Parliament will still not vote for it. This Remain Parliament, and therefore his call for an election is the right thing to do. Yeah, Let the public yeah, decide. Yeah, yeah. All right, my, my honourable friend is entirely right, and uh, he speaks for his constituency. They want to deliver Brexit. He wants uh, to deliver Brexit. They just want to spin it out forever till the 12th of never, uh, Mr Speaker. And, and when the 12th of never eventually comes round, they'll devise one of their complicated parliamentary uh, procedures and move a motion for a further delay and a further, a further extension then, Mr Speaker. And I have to say, Mr Speaker, I think that this delay is becoming seriously damaging to the national interest. Because families can't plan, businesses can't plan, and the climate of uncertainty is not only corroding trust in politics, but is beginning to hold everybody back from making vital everyday decisions that are, uh, that are important for the health of our economy. Buying new homes, hiring new staff, making new investments. The performance of the UK economy is frankly miraculous, uh, considering the stasis here in Parliament. And that is why I hope that so many of our colleagues will support this bill uh, today, including uh, the Father of the House, for whom I have uh, the highest respect. My right honourable friend was one of those who delayed Brexit in March by voting against departure then on the deal that had then been negotiated. 
he did get a majority of 30 for his deal in principle last week. And if the subsequent time of this House had been devoted to the committee and report stage of the House following the ordinary principle of the government, we'd be well on our way to leaving in the middle of November. So can I respect, say to my right honourable friend, can you find a slightly better basis for fighting this election when we get to the campaign in due course? Yeah. Mr Speaker, actually, I, I, I'm afraid that my right honourable friend is, is in error. I voted for uh, the withdrawal bill, and I hope that he will vote. I hope that he will vote for this bill today to get Brexit done. I hope, and I hope that he will. I, and I take his, I take his nod as assent to, to that proposition, because that is the way, Mr Speaker. That is the way. Sorry, I will give, I will give way with pleasure to the right honourable gentleman. Might I ask the Prime Minister to look at the amendment that I've tabled, which suggests that we, if we work um, seven days a week, like many of my constituents do, we could get the Brexit bill through and meet his deadline. Um, isn't a Brexit in the hand better than two Brexits in the bush? <laughs> I, I'm very grateful to the right honourable gentleman who is, uh, I, I know, uh, wants to deliver Brexit, and, and the, the idea he puts forward is one that uh, I'm afraid that we tried twice. We tried it last week, we tried it uh, last night. I, I do think that that would have been a, a good offer for the right honourable gentleman to take up. He refused to take it up, and we are left with no choice but to go to the country to break free from this impasse and to allow us all to submit as we must in all humility to the judgment of the electorate, and to allow us to make our case, and above all, to allow a new and revitalised Parliament with a new mandate to deliver on the will of the people and get Brexit done. Because that new Parliament, in just a few weeks' time, will have before it a great new deal with the EU, EU a great new deal. Uh, that brings together members across the House, as, as the, as the Honourable Lady uh, mentioned earlier on. And it will be the job of that new Parliament, in just a few weeks' time, to ratify that deal, that withdrawal deal, and put an end to this long period of parliamentary dither and delay. And I, I'm glad to say, Mr Speaker, that since I first put forward the idea of a general election as a way out of this impasse, the ice flows have begun to crack, and the Lib Dems are now in favour of it, and the Scots Nats, the Scottish Nationalist Party, is now in favour of it. There is only one blockage still standing in the way of democracy. There is only one party that refuses to trust the judgment of the people. There is only one party that is still running, running scared of an election, and that is the main party of opposition. Who are failing in their defining function? Dog, dogs bark. Well, I'm, we haven't heard any. We haven't heard anything to the contrary. Dogs bark, cows moo. Oppositions are meant to campaign for elections, except for this one. And I have no, I have no way of knowing. I have no way of knowing what the uh, honourable gentleman is going, right honourable gentleman is going to say. He's had 35. He's called 35 times uh, for elections since uh, the uh, in the last year alone. I have no idea why he's been so opposed to an election. Maybe it's because. He's uh, been following the precepts of his, his intellectual mentor, Fidel Castro, whose adoring crowds used to serenade him, Mr. Speaker, with the cry of revoluciones si, elecciones no. Maybe, may, maybe he's congenitally opposed. Maybe, may, or maybe he's been listening to his honourable friends, the, the Shadow Chancellor or the, the, right, the member for Ho Hoban and St Pancras, uh, who have been arguing, I gather, against. An election. I just want to say to the right honourable gentleman, you should be wear, beware of their motives in counselling him against a general election, because it's not so much that they fear a general election, though probably they do. It's just that they don't want a general election with him as their leader. But, but whatever, whatever, I don't know what's been holding him back uh, from this obvious democratic. Uh, exercise, but whatever it is, I hope that he will now. And I, I, I've listened to. Or I hope that he will now stand up and say that he has mastered his doubts and that he is finally willing to submit to the electorate. And he's mentioned that he's a great eater of porridge, Mr. Speaker. 
All I can say is that when it comes to elections, he, in, in, his, in his fastidious, is when it comes to the offer of elections, he reminds me of Goldilocks, Mr Speaker. Uh, one's, one offer is too hot, one's too cold. I hope he'll be able to stand up this afternoon and say this time, this offer of an election is just right. Because it is, Mr Speaker. And if he does, and I hope he does, then we will be able to put that choice to the people of this country. And we can go his way, which is for an economic recipe that would mean the destruction of the UK wealth-creating system, over-taxation of a kind that's derived from revolutionary Venezuela, Venezuela combined with the political, the political nightmare, a nightmare agenda of not one but two referendums, one on the EU, that's his policy as far as I understand it, one in Scotland, with all their potential for further rancour and recrimination, Mr Speaker, or else we can go forward with this government, a government that has secured a great deal, that allows us now to leave the EU as one whole United Kingdom, one whole United Kingdom. England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, one whole United Kingdom, able together to do free trade deals around the world, able to set our own path, to make our own laws, to take back control of our borders, our money and our, and our regulations, able, able to deliver all the benefits and all the freedoms, Mr Speaker, of Brexit from new free ports to more humane treatment of animals, which he would block, from tax breaks for new technology to cutting VAT on sanitary products. It's a deal, Mr Speaker, that they said was impossible three months ago. They said we couldn't change the withdrawal agreement. They said that we'd never get rid of the backstop, and we did. And the deal is that. The deal is that. And it is ready to be approved by a new parliament and it will have a government that is yearning with every fibre of its being to be able to get on and deliver our One Nation Conservative agenda. A vision for uniting this country, for uniting this country and levelling up with record investments in health, like nothing else in a generation. 20,000 more police officers, more funding for every primary, every secondary school in the country, levelling up across this whole United Kingdom. A government that is able to commit to fantastic public services and infrastructure precisely, precisely because we believe in free markets and enterprise. We believe in them. And we believe in free markets and enterprise and in the wealth creating sector of this economy in a way that causes a shadow of Transylvanian horror to pass over the semi-communist faces of the, of the, of the front bench opposite. And that is, that is the argument. That is the argument that I want to have with the right honourable gentleman, because that, frankly, Mr Speaker, is the biggest and most important difference between us, between us One Nation Conservatives and the Socialist opposite. And there is only one way now. There is only one way now to move this country forward and to have that debate, and that is to get Brexit done. And there is only one way to get Brexit done in the face of this unrelenting parliamentary obstructionism, this endless, willful, fingers crossed, not me, gov refusal to deliver on the mandate of the people, and that is, Mr. Speaker, to refresh this parliament and give the people a choice. And I say to the whole House, I say to the whole House, and to all those who may still be hesitating about whether to vote for this, for this bill, there is only one way to restore the esteem in which our democracy is held, and to recover the respect in which Parliament should be held by the people of this country, and that is finally to offer ourselves to the judgment of the people of this country. And I commend this bill. is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Labour backs a general election because we want this country to be rid of this reckless and destructive Conservative government. A government, a government that has caused more of our children to be living in poverty more pensioners to be in poverty and more people to be in in-work poverty, more families without a home to call their own and more people sleeping rough on our streets, a government that has cut 
and sold off so much of our important public services. No, I won't give way. That created, and that government which created the vicious, hostile environment which saw our own citizens deported from this country. It is time for real change. And I've said consistently, when no deal is off the table, we will back an election. Today, after much denial and much bluster by the Prime Minister, that deal is officially off the table. So this country can vote for the government that it deserves. One. Yes. I, I, I thank my right hon. Friend, and I shall be voting against an early election uh, today and, and, and encourage as many of my colleagues as possible to, to defy the threats and blandishments to do so. Because the, the reality is that the uncertainty of an outcome of a general election certainly most, do, most certainly does not take no deal off the table. I hope my friend will join in this campaign to defeat this government, to bring in a government that will end injustice, poverty and inequality in this country. That is what I joined the Labour Party for all those years ago, and that I'll be very proud to take as our message to the people of this country, and to give our public services the funding they need and end the threat of privatisation that hangs over so many public service workers, and stop the grotesque poverty and inequality in our country rebuilding an economy in every region and every nation of this country. Tackle the climate emergency with a Green New Deal, a green industrial revolution that will bring good quality jobs to many areas of the country that have been denied them by this government and their Liberal Democrat accomplices during the coalition years. And after three years of Conservative failure, get Brexit sorted by, and we're the only party doing it, say give the people a final say on what happens over Brexit. We will now launch the most, we will launch the most ambitious radical campaign for real change in this country. And I look, and I look forward to campaigning in a general election all over the country, including in Uxbridge, if the Prime Minister is still the Conservative candidate there at that time. Mr Speaker. I'm, ex I'm extremely grateful. I'm extremely grateful to the Leader of the Opposition for giving way. Can I ask him that in the upcoming election we are about to have, front and centre will be the right of the Scottish people to choose their own future. If the Scottish National Party win a majority of seats in Scotland, would he respect that result? I'm looking forward to campaigning all over Scotland to support Labour candidates to be elected in Scotland. Indeed, I was there last weekend, and the enthusiasm of Scottish Labour to get out there and campaign is palpable all over. And I'm delighted to support Scottish Labour in their campaign to bring £70 billion of public investment into Scotland under a Labour government, something the SNP cannot offer. I thank my right hon. Friend for giving way and I look forward to campaigning with him in Scotland in the upcoming election. Yeah. But, but as he will know, the, one of the crucial things in this election is going to be turnout and ensuring we can get as many people out and using their votes as possible. In Scotland especially, it's, it's very dark, it's very cold. Would he support the idea to have a polling day as a public holiday to ensure maximum turnout? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thank my friend for that inter intervention and compliment her on her work. And I agree with her that a public holiday on Election Day would actually be a very good idea because it does mean that everyone could then get along to vote without the problems of being at work at that time. It's something that uh, has been discussed before, and uh, I don't know all the amendments that are coming up uh, later on this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, but if that one is included, that would be very welcome indeed. Yes. 
I found my right, I found my right honourable friend for, for give, uh, giving way, and um, he will know. And I, I raised this yesterday. I've tabled um, a, a cross-party member, supported by many Labour colleagues, um, for uh, votes at 16 at the table. And would he agree with me? The Prime Minister talks a lot about the United Kingdom. In Wales and in Scotland, 16-year-olds now have the right to vote in elections and in referenda, and that should be afforded to all the United Kingdom 16-year-olds. I, I thank my friend for that intervention. I'm coming on to that in a moment, but I absolutely do agree with him that uh, all 16-year-olds should have the right to vote because it seems to me fundamental to our democracy. It's young people's future, after all, that we'll be debating in this election. I thank him for his intervention and the work he's done on bringing about parliamentary scrutiny to this whole process. Mr Speaker, the House has ag- amended the programme motion. And it amended the programme motion, I think, in a very helpful way, which empowers this chamber, the House of Commons, to amend this legislation. But I think we should just reflect for a moment. The Prime Minister was actually trying to stifle parliamentary democracy. An unprecedented, an almost unprecedented edict that only the government could amend its own legislation, which presumably they wrote last night. So the idea of amending today what they wrote last night suggests they have a problem over memory loss, perhaps over an item or something. I don't know what it is. And so I am pleased that those amendments are going to be debated today. No, I won't give way. And what it does, Mr Speaker, is sums up in a couple of words, the undemocratic and authoritarian instincts of this government and this Prime Minister in their relation to Parliament. So I want to put on record my thanks to my friend, the member for Walthamstow, for her persistence in tabling that amendment last night, which means that the House will have an opportunity to debate a number of very serious amendments today. And we will be seeking to um, expand the franchise in the December election. That means supporting votes at 16, as is the case now, for Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly elections. And I think it also means that we support the rights of EU citizens with settled status to vote in elections in this country. After all, we do recognise their contribution to our society. We do give them votes in local elections. It seems to me only logical. Since they've made their future in this country, in our society, they should have a a right to vote on their future as well. And I look forward to supporting those amendments later on today. I thank the Honourable Gentleman and I look forward to getting out on the campaign trail and smashing the Conservatives at the ballot box and returning more Labour colleagues here. I am particularly pleased about what he's just said around EU um, uh, settled status uh, here. We already allow Commonwealth citizens to vote in our elections and I want to ask him if he will make sure that we try and ensure all EU uh, citizens who are settled here get to vote as well. Yes, my my friend is right that for uh, uh, permanently Commonwealth citizens have had the right to vote in British elections and that's absolutely right and most Commonwealth countries, so far as I know, reciprocate on that. And the uh, relationship with Ireland means that all Irish nationals have an automatic right to vote in UK elections and vice versa. No, I won't give way. And so it seems to me... It, no, I won't. It seems to me... Abs- it, I've already reminded you that I wasn't going to give way, so I say it again, no. The right Honourable Gentleman should resume his seat. He's been in the House since 2001, so he's familiar with the parliamentary etiquette, which stipulates quite clearly that when somebody who has the floor is not giving way, the Right Honourable Gentleman accepts the verdict. He doesn't have a right to intervene, and he ought to have learned that by now. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And so we just make that point that we want any election to involve as many people as possible. It is meant to be a big exercise in democracy, and I hope the amendments... I've already reminded I reminded you I wasn't going to give way, so I say for the fourth time, no. (laughs) That uh, in that election, everyone should have the right to participate in it. It's their their future and this country's future that is at stake. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has failed in his promise to be out of the European Union, do or die, on the 31st of October. But it may be that date Parliament dissolves and therefore will mark the end of his tenure in office. 
So, Mr Speaker, whatever date the House decides the election will be, I'm ready for it, we're ready for it, because we want to, we want to be able to say to the people of this country, there is an alternative to austerity, there is an alternative to inequality, there is an alternative to sweetheart trade deals with Donald Trump, there is an alternative of a government that invests in all parts of the country, and a government that's determined to end injustice in our society, and a government that's determined to give our young people a sense of hope in their society, rather than the prospects of indebtedness and insecure employment in the future, which is sadly all the Conservative government and their coalition with the Lib Dems ever brought them. I'm very ready to go out there and give that message in any election, whenever it comes. Yeah. Sir William Cash.